Good morning, Trinity. Um, it's good to be with you all. A couple of notes on the on the forefront. We have Crossroads uh, Church with us from Ohio. Uh, so if you're a regular attender with us and you're noticing, wow, it's very full this morning, uh, we have them to thank. Uh, thank you very much. They bring, they bring in 30. Uh, for a little backstory, uh, they partner with Hunger Corps. Uh, we've made announcements about them uh, before. We've had a long-standing relationship with them, and so has Crossroads. And so they send, I don't know, four or five or, or more teams a year. Uh, down to help hunger in the community in La Amiga and the work that they're doing in Dorado and some of the community outreach that we're doing. We're happy to partner with them. Um, so welcome, guys. Thank you for being here. Um, the second note is, uh, if you were here early this morning, I made a wardrobe change. That's because the 7 to 12-year-old silly stringed me this morning. So if I've got some bits dangling off, then that's, that's what's going on. Um, but it was uh, fun to be at their kind of uh, semester end uh, party for uh, our, their Sunday school class that we have in the morning. So we've been in the book of Zechariah. We're not far in. This is the second sermon, uh, and we're going to be reading from chapter one this morning. And as I was reading about this uh, particular passage, it struck me that we don't like silence. We don't like silence. I think most of us have some music or something playing in the background or podcast in our ears. Silence unsettles us and causes our mind to wander and think about things we prefer not to. Emotions are brought up that we don't want to handle. But another thing about silence is when we're watching movies and horror and thriller movies, we know that when it's silent, we're always expecting the jump moment, right? Sometimes it's not so much the silence itself, uh, but I've recently uh, talked with someone who has tinnitus. And so they were afraid of silence, not because they actually experienced silence. What they wanted was silence, but all they could hear was the ringing. And it like drove them a little bit crazy, and no, nobody wants that either. Of all these kind of experiences around silence, though, I think one of the most painful for us is relational silence. One that we all experience is when we lose a loved one. We talk to them, but there's silence. We can experience this a little bit if we can't contact them for some reason, if their phone died or they're traveling, or they were supposed to check in and they haven't, and we have that little spike of anxiety of, are they okay? There's silence we haven't heard in a while. But even maybe the worst form of silence that we experience relationally is the silent treatment. This form of manipulative silence is so painful because one party is yearning for personal connection, for the dignity of a response, but the other person decides not to respond at all, to turn a cold shoulder, to make them pay for something that they did. Now I know that we've all probably used the silent treatment on others, And if we're honest, we probably use them as some sort of coping mechanism. Like we feel attacked, challenged, disrespected, or harmed, and so we use the only response that we think we have, the silence treatment. Sin is messy in this way, but I think that most of us, if we reflect on the situations, realize that the use of the silent treatment is not really a mature uh, way of resolving conflict. It's not a sign of emotional health and stability. But doesn't it feel like we kind of get the silent treatment from God? We long for personal connection, the dignity of a response from our God, and it feels like he gives no response at all. He gives the cold shoulder. How do we know that God isn't giving us the silent treatment? The prophet Zechariah is speaking to God's people about this very phenomenon. We're going to be talking about the historical situation a little bit more, but uh, Zechariah was writing around 520 B.C. This is 500 years before Jesus. And here was the situation that was going on. Uh, It's been 70 years since the destruction of the temple. 70 years of God's people crying out for deliverance and for mercy. And you know what they heard in response? Silence. Zechariah's job is to speak to these people about why God is not giving them the silent treatment. Zechariah's job is to teach them that that God really does know and God really does care. These are going to be our two points this morning for you note takers out there. God really does know and God really does care. But before we get to those points, I'd invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes from Zechariah chapter 1, starting in verse 7. We're going to be reading through verse 17. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 7. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, In the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Iddo, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. 
He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, we have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. The angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, How long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, against which you have been angry these 70 years? And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out, thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my, sh- my cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. This ends the reading of God's word. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. May he bless them for you and for me. Please be seated. <clears throat> So we're asking the question today about whether or not God gives us the silent treatment, and we're going to be uh, trying to answer this question from the minor prophets. And if we're honest, the minor prophets are really hard for us to read, mostly because we don't know history. Now, I think if you were to just read this passage, and we had just read a passage from Revelation before, if you know anything about Christianity or quasi-Christian material, you read this story about the horses, this vision about the horses, and you think about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I just want to be clear from the beginning, whatever symbolism Revelation is borrowing from Zechariah is borrowing from Zechariah, not the other way around. And this is important to understand when we read the Old Testament, because we have to understand that Zechariah and the Old Testament people of God lived by faith in God's word just like we do. They just had a lot less of it. What they saw in a mirror dimly, we now see completed. So we don't read Jesus back into the Old Testament, but we recognize that the Old Testament is fundamentally about Jesus. Some key distinctions there. So if we understand the Old Testament correctly, when we look at Jesus, we should understand him even better. That's the purpose of understanding Zechariah this morning. You might think, well, this is Zechariah speaking to Isaiah. What does this have to do about the silence that I feel from God? But fundamentally, we as the people of God experience the same things that Zechariah's people were experiencing. But in order to understand the Old Testament correctly, most of us need a brief history lesson. So strap in, because I know some of you don't like history. Some of you are like lighting up right now. You're like, oh, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about history. Some of you are like, oh, no. But just, it won't be too long. We just need a little bit of backstory. King David, you know, David and Goliath, that David, he lived and he ruled about 1050 B.C., His son Solomon would take the throne after him, and he would be wise, and he would be rich. But in his old age, his many wives would lead him astray to worship other gods, so that his son Rehoboam would actually oversee a civil war in Israel. And then there would be a northern kingdom, and there would be a southern kingdom. This would happen in 950 BC. So just for clarity, the United Nations state of Israel existed for about 100 years before it split spectacularly. Now, it would limp along for a while in this divided state, Uh, And in the southern kingdom, they would have some good kings who would restore proper worship to God, uh, and they would return to God. Um, They would hear prophets. But ultimately, when push came to shove, they would reject God's word. They would reject all the prophets that he sent. And they would be um, carried out into exile. Now, the northern kingdom falls a little bit sooner. They didn't have any good kings. They didn't return to worship to God. Uh, they, They fell to the Assyrians in 722 B.C., The southern kingdom, sometimes called Judah or Jerusalem, would fall to the Babylonians in 586. Now, I described this fall of the southern kingdom to the Babylonians a couple weeks ago, but I just want to uh, retell you what it was like just to give you some color, uh, because the Babylonians were not good people. So Zedekiah, the last uh, um, king of, of Jerusalem in that time, when the Babylonians showed up on the doorstep, what they did when they captured him was they forced him to watch the murder execution of his sons. And then they gouged out his eyes. So that the last thing that he saw would be the most painful thing that he ever saw. This is who the Babylonians were. 
This is what they did to Zedekiah. Then they carried off all the people and they destroyed the temple brick by brick down to the very foundations and spread it out across the land. They carried the people away from their land and said, you can't stay here, and they dispersed them among their cities. The Babylonian Empire wouldn't last too much longer after this, but during this Babylonian time, we get kind of the stories of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. If you know those stories in the Bible, that's when this is happening. But the Persian Empire would rise up in 539 B.C., And in some political turmoil early in the Persian Empire, a man named Darius the Great would seize an opportunity to the throne. And although he had a loyal army, the populace uh, wasn't too fond of him. And so he had revolts all across the empire in the first year and a half of his reign. So the first year and a half of his reign is spent squashing out these revolts one by one. And all this is important because of the very first verse that we have here. In the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius. Just one side note here. Sometimes we like to treat the Bible's history as if it's less than accurate. But the Bible's history here is very accurate. It's accurate in what it claims, and we have outside sources that can attest to that, but it's accurate even within itself. Because what we're going to read here is a description, a vision that he has that correlates some with what Zechariah is experiencing in the Persian Empire at this very time. Darius is at peace. The enemy of God's people has squashed out every revolt that is there, and he now rules over everything from India to Bulgaria. So Zechariah has this vision. Let's get into this vision a little bit. It says, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. And he was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Now, these horses appear to be normal horses. They don't, they don't appear to be supernatural or kind of the best analogy that he can find. He's using normal colors to describe horses that were described in the Persian Empire. But what's the deal with horses, especially for Zechariah? And again, you have to understand the context. So the Persian Empire was so good because of their mounted horses that could carry military intelligence faster than their enemy. Part of the reason that Darius was able to so effectively quell all these revolts that happened in Egypt and other places was because his mounted riders were better. They had better intelligence, they had accurate intelligence, and they were faster than their enemies. So Zechariah's next question is natural. Whose horses are these? (laughs) What horses am I looking at? Are these Persian horses? Are these the enemies and our oppressors' horses? Or are they God's horses? You could say that in some sense, Zechariah, after experiencing, um, he's he's probably not 70 years old, but but after experiencing his his, uh, uh, people's uh, experience in exile, he's sitting there wondering, is God staying silent? And in this vision that I'm seeing, am I seeing the the Persians take final control? So verses 9 and 10, I said, who are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me said, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, these are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. These are not Persian military intelligence. They are God's military intelligence. Mounted riders were a sign of military power. And if your riders were reporting to you, it means that you were active in keeping control over your realm. But I just, I got a question for you. Do you think in Zechariah's time, it felt like God was active in keeping control over his realm? Or do you think he felt like he was getting the silent treatment? Now, we might even be wondering as we read this in English, you know, four horses seems pretty insignificant compared to the Persian army's network of military intelligence. How is God going to compete with this? But, you know, actually in Hebrew, it's a little bit uh, easier to understand that there's probably a lot more horses than just four. Let me explain. There's one leader mounted... Uh, on the red horse, who then dismounts, which was customary when you're giving a report to a superior uh, in the Persian military. You would dismount to give your report. And it seems that all of the other riders were already dismounted, and there was various groups of red, sorrel, uh, and the other color that I'm missing, <laughs> um, of white horses. Red, sorrel, and white horses. It's possible that there were only three, but the text leads us to believe that it might have been tens, might have been hundreds, may have even been thousands of horses. There were many riders reporting to the angel. God has an extensive military intelligence program. But the next question might be, is his military intelligence accurate? Does he actually know what's going on? Does God know about Zedekiah's eyes? Does God know about Zedekiah's sons? 
So their report is given in verse 11. We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. That word rest is close to the word peace, but it has more to do with power. They were at rest because they had squashed all of their opponents. And this is exactly what Zechariah was seeing with King Darius. Darius was at peace. Having squashed all of his enemies and rebellions, he had no fear of any other king anywhere in the known world. There was no fear of God, no consideration that God might have military intelligence that he may not know. Darius, the enemy of God's people, was at peace, and God's military intelligence are reporting just that. The king of the known world is at peace. Now, this doesn't seem quite like good news yet, but we just have to stop here at this first point. God knows, and God knows accurately. If ever in the midst of God's silence, when you've, you've been wondering, God, why are you silent? If you've ever had the thought cross your mind that maybe God doesn't know what's going on, you'd be mistaken. And it's not just because God has writers and angels, but it's because God is everywhere. He sees everything. He sees every wrong. He witnesses every injustice. He sees all of your sin, and he sees all the sin of the whole world. He sees the leaders of the whole world at rest, not fearing him or his people at all. God isn't ignorant. God knows, and God sees everything. But if it's true that no matter what we're experiencing, that God knows it, and he still stays silent, it must mean he doesn't care. So this is our second point. After all, if God is seeing our sons murdered and our eyes gouged out, why is he silent? You see, most of us don't really doubt the knowledge of the Lord, I don't think. I think if I were to ask any of you this morning before we started the sermon, does God know everything? Most of you would be like, of course God knows everything. We don't doubt the knowledge of the Lord, we doubt his care. And the angel of the Lord asked this same logical question. Look at verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years. This angel is essentially asking God, do you even care? Your enemies are at peace. Does it matter to you at all? The Lord's response is immediate. Verse 13, and the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. God answers in gracious and comforting words not cold and distant, not silent treatment, not a disdainful look, not a maniacal laugh, not a cold shoulder, gracious and comforting. We're told a little bit more about what these gracious and comforting words are in the following verses. I'd invite you to follow along with me. Verse 14, it's gracious and comforting that God is jealous. Now, we don't usually think of jealousy as care, but it is. It's like the jealousy of a husband for his wife, uh, not a petty, vindictive, insecure jealousy, but in relation to his own character, he considers no one as highly as he does his own wife. And although a good husband will, of course, have relationships with other women in his life, he will not allow uh, any of those to occupy the place of the one to whom he's made covenantal promises. She occupies a particular place in his life. She is bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. He would never demote her with a cold shoulder, the silent treatment with mistreatment or neglect. He is jealous for her. God is jealous for us. Verse 15, he's exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. This is something that we also want, uh, but it's difficult for us because we read the New Testament and we hear about Jesus turning the other cheek, right? So we, we think of God in the Old Testament as kind of angry and vindictive, but you know, Jesus comes and he's like, turn your other cheek. But you might say that although Jesus is long-suffering, he never says that suffering will be eternal. He does say that he will come again to execute judgment. Part of what we read in Revelation includes that. If God sees what's going on in the world, we want him to care enough to make it right. Now, if there's a way to make it right through Jesus' blood so that our perceived enemies, those who have done us wrong, are able to be reconciled to God as well, and then we can forgive and move on, then praise be to his name. But if they can't, God stamp them out. Let not sin increase. Let no one else be harmed by the evil and malicious people that are in this world. Verse 16, I will return to Jerusalem with mercy. I don't know how you tend to think about God's return. I think we tend to think about it as vengeful and angry and vindictive. 
But it says that his return to Jerusalem is going to be with mercy. We're worried that he's going to be angry with us, that he'll retaliate, but he returns with mercy, with salvation, with reconciliation. Verse 16, he'll build his house in Jerusalem. And God isn't just saying that he's going to visit for a brief time, stay for a little bit, and then move on to where he really wants to go. He's going to build a house amongst his people. And this is important because in Israel's history, you have to understand, the Babylonians just demantled the temple brick by brick and scattered it across the land. They said, your God is powerless to defend his own home. We are the power. But even long before this, because of Israel's disobedience, the presence of the Lord had left the temple. It was a day of great weeping and sadness, and people in Zechariah's day were waiting for the glory of the Lord to come again and dwell in the temple so that God would dwell with his people, not just be a visiting presence here and there, but would be present all the time. And God is saying that he will build it that he will dwell in it. Verse 16, I will stretch a measuring line over Jerusalem. A measuring line is a reference that we'll see again in Zechariah and other of the minor prophets. And it symbolizes God measuring kind of the size of his, of his kingdom, not just his house, but the whole kingdom, the bounds of his whole city. There wouldn't just be a house. There would be this whole kingdom with great works that would cause prosperity, verse 17, and comfort and a knowledge that they were chosen. These aren't the words of a careless God but a God who deeply cares. But if he cares like this, with jealousy, with mercy, why does he still feel so silent? Why does it still feel like he's giving us the silent treatment? God knows and God cares, but pay attention to who he responds to in this passage. He doesn't respond to Zechariah. He doesn't respond to the cries of his people. He responds to someone in particular. Look again at verse 12. The angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem in the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? And the idea is this. So Zechariah has this vision and there's this angel next to him that's giving him this vision. And then when he asks about the horses, the angel says, I will show you. And then the, the angel, in some sense, like steps into the vision. Zechariah can't. He's, he's like outside of it. The angel steps in, and all of a sudden, he's like among the myrtle trees, too, if you read this again. So you've got this dismounted rider among the myrtle trees in the glen, and then you have this angel that's also in the glen. And all of a sudden, when the angel enters the scene, all of the riders defer to his authority. They give the report, although they were sent out by the Lord, to this angel. Now, it is possible that this messenger was just an angel, but many commentators, and I myself kind of believe that this was the pre-incarnate Son of God. The second person of the Trinity, who we often call Jesus, has existed for all time. Of course, he was conceived and born of the Virgin Mary and given the name Jesus, but he existed long before that. And there are many times in the Old Testament where we suspect that he showed up in the midst of his people. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We don't read Jesus back into the Old Testament. I said that at the beginning. But we use it to see Jesus all the clearer. And this text doesn't really tell us who this angel is. Angel is not a a technical term referring to what we think of with wings and everything. It's just messenger. It's the same word that's used for any messenger that any king uses throughout all of the Old Testament. It's just a messenger that goes. Regardless of whether this angel uh, is an actual angel as we think of it in our minds or the pre-incarnate Lord, we learn something profound about the kind of person that God responds to. God responds to the person who is able to cry out to him. Last week, Kyle told us that God said this in the beginning of Zechariah, if you would turn to me, I would turn to you. The problem is we cannot turn to him. Neither could Zechariah, neither could his people. They were in some sense dead in their trespasses and sins with hearts of stone. They did not have hearts of flesh because they did not have one interceding for them yet. Zechariah is unable to speak in this vision. In fact, there doesn't seem to be anyone who is able to speak in this vision besides uh, the Lord's uh, military intelligence and the angel. As I mentioned, biblically speaking, Israel was dead in her trespasses and sins. They were children of darkness and not children of light. They were mute and with hearts of stone. It isn't that God was giving them the silent treatment in the Old Testament, but that God longed to respond to them, but there was no one who could. Valley of dry bones, it says in Ezekiel. 
picked clean. They needed an intercessor, someone to cry out for them who was alive. How long, O oh Lord? And when this intercessor cried out, God responded immediately. We need the same intercessor. Someone who has a heart of flesh, who has a broken spirit and a contrite heart. We need someone who obeys God's word from the heart and turns back to God. And when he cries out for us, God responds immediately. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament will describe this intercessor as a priest. In chapter 4, it'll say, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. In some sense, he has stepped into our story. He has taken on our flesh and experienced the sufferings of our world and even death itself. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin." The next verse says this, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Zechariah had a vision of an intercessor, but Zechariah just had a vision. We have the reality in Christ Jesus. Jesus is our intercessor, our mediator, who allows us in our time of need to draw near in confidence. And we know that the Lord will respond immediately because Jesus has interceded for us. Jesus also fulfills all these things that Zechariah was talking about. When Zechariah came, he returned, or I'm sorry, when Jesus came, he returned to Jerusalem with mercy and spoke graciously and compassionately. When Jesus came, he defeated mankind's most ancient enemy and he jealously fought for his people. When Jesus came, he tore down the temple and he rebuilt it in himself with his own body, body resurrected on the third day. He made the sacrifice of sacrifices. He is the new temple. When Jesus came, he established a kingdom whose measure would have no end. And this kingdom would signify prosperity and comfort and wholeness and healing. And he would cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame walk. When Jesus came, he came to bring dead things back to life. When Jesus came, he interceded for his people, and God responded immediately. God doesn't give you the, silence treat, the silent treatment. He gives you his son, who carries you to the Father, intercedes on your behalf, and said, my life for theirs. Hebrews will continue to describe Jesus as the high priest representing and advocating and interceding for his people. In chapter 5, it'll say this, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. And you know what? Jesus is still in his flesh. The tomb is empty. The body is resurrected. He is still offering up prayers and supplications, interceding at the right hand of the Father with loud cries and tears to him who is able to save even from death. And he is heard because of his reverence, because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus' cries for us are always heard. In whatever silence you think that you're experiencing from God, I would invite you to run to Jesus and hear his cries for you. They're not cries of silence or of vindictive or of anger, but of mercy, jealously fighting for you, who knows every single thing that you've been through, sees it, and will make all things right. Jesus Christ is the Word of God incarnate, and He is living and active today. He is not ignorant, but knows exactly what you're facing. He is not apathetic, but deeply cares. He cares so much that He would give up His own life for yours. He would come to give you hope. He is the intercessor who is right now at the right hand of the Father interceding for you, not in silence, not in a cold shoulder, but with cries of mercy and deliverance paid for by his very body and blood. And here's the deal. His body and blood are so sufficient that God responds immediately. Now, understanding Zechariah's description of God's silence as uh, the one who responds, 
that God is the one who responds, he's, he's not silenced to us, um, is, is seen even clearer at this table. It is only the body and blood of Jesus that makes us alive. It is only by the body and blood of Jesus, move this out a little bit, it's only by the body and blood of Jesus that we are able to turn to God again and cry out. It is only in Jesus' body and blood where we see uh, the mercy and jealousy of the Lord fight for us time and time again. And so this table is for Christians who know that they are dependent upon the broken body and the shed blood of Christ alone. This table is for those Christians who know that Jesus is the only one that advocates for them. It's not those who think that they can clean themselves up and come back next week and then God will be finally proud to invite them to the table, but that the only reason that they're invited is because someone else died in their place. And this is what this table reminds us of. The night that Jesus was betrayed, when he would give his life for ours, when his disciples rejected him, he took bread, and having blessed it, he broke it. And he turned and he gave it to his disciples, as I am ministering his name, now give it to you. And Jesus said to them, take this bread and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it and given thanks, he said to the disciples, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the remission of the sins of many. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. If you believe that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man, if he's the only one who can cry out and the only one who can tug on God's ear, uh, the only one who uh, is able to stand uh, in front of the throne room as innocent, and he's your only hope in life and death, that I invite you to come to this table. If that's not true for you, uh, if you uh, are not a Christian and you have not been baptized, or if you are a Christian uh, and you kind of think that you should clean yourself up before you come to this table, that Jesus is a little bit ashamed to have you here, that he wants you to go fix everything before you depend upon his body and his blood, I'd ask you to refrain from this meal as well. We don't want you to leave, don't get me wrong, but Jesus says that it's dangerous if you're not dependent upon this alone to come and partake of his body and his blood. In a moment, I'll pray, and then we can come down the center aisle, and we can go to this uh, serving station over here uh, and right here. Uh, the gluten-free option is available at that table, so just notify your server and go that way if, if you require that. And then there is red wine and clear grape juice. Please take according to your conscience. If you would, please pray with me. Lord Jesus, our great high priest and intercessor, we thank you for the free invitation to this table. But we do come before this table with humble awe to be reminded that we, need you, we needed you to die for us. That we were blind until you gave us your sight. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would nourish our faith to depend upon Jesus' body and blood more and more every day, every minute of every day. And we ask this only in Jesus' name. Amen.